Master, did you give did you give us a show? How late were we? Got I don't know. I told the board that. Oh, did you? Okay. I don't know. He did. Ghana, the old Gold Coast, oh, yeah. rich okay. in natural resources, but many of its people are locked in poverty. One man who knows what it's like to be poor is now their champion. Yeah. When I go to the communities well, and they say they are hungry, I know what it is. He doesn't know exactly when, when people have it, land so. and it's been taken away uh, and that they, they are not going to have anything to eat, I understand it. This week on African Voices, Daniel hey, Owusu Korontae, so no founder and like CEO of mining advocacy NGO, Welcome. Oh, you just go away. You gotta be exactly. Of course you don't know. Yeah, give the show or you You could have got it from the guy, but he got out. So Scott just got on the board, so he can't. Whoever was on before him. Ghanaian activist Daniel Owusu Korenteng is a man of many missions. A trade unionist by day, he's always felt the need to do more, to be a voice for those who struggle to be heard, the rural poor of his native right. land. I was born and bred in a very strict Persian, you know, background. And that gave me a foundation to understand that good things are good, bad things are bad. You know, I had to know, even as a young person, that I did not need to cut edges in life. And that I should see uh, myself as a person created by God and that I had a purpose in life. These were things that were provided to me as part of my family background as a, a son of a president priest. And um, also when we were growing up, something happened. What happened was that when I was the age of 10, my father died. My mother was it's a very strong personality type. She was a type who felt that um, she would not succumb to any challenges of life. And she decided to take us, we have five children, she decided to take us from home and um, settled in the eastern region of Ghana and decided to bring us up single-handed. And um, that brought us, that shifted us from, well, so what I say, the more comfortable life of living in a month in the, in the, what do you call it, the, in, the, in the religious environment into some harsh environment. And within that period, I learned a lot of things. I learned to understand what was hunger. I, um, I learned to understand what poor people go through. Um, even though my, my mother ne never stopped telling us that we were going through this um, for a purpose, especially for our education. But I have grown to understand that it was my school, my life, and the problem that we, but that we went through within the period when things were tough. That made me a good person. I used to have regrets about my father's death and ask about why my father should die at a time when things, when we were just growing up. But today I understand that when nature wants to use you or God wants to use you for many things, it makes you go round. And as you go round, you gather different experiences. And that, that is what has become the motivating you know, um, drive for me. When I go to the communities and they say they're hungry, I know what it is. When people have land and it's been taken away and that they, they are not going to have anything to eat, I understand it. As a young man, Daniel decided to devote his life to helping the less fortunate. He knew he needed a partner who shared his commitment. I had taken a contract with, with nature. And I wanted a woman who also had this understanding of life in terms of the higher purpose of life of helping the poor. And I met this beautiful woman in school, you know, physically beautiful. Then I realized that she shared a lot of my convictions. Uh, even though she came from uh, what I would call a middle class background. But she shared very strong sentiments and convictions about ordinary people. And that became the starting point of um, strengthening our relationship and then it turned into marriage. 
And so began a life partnership between Daniel and his bride, Hannah, a sharing of both domestic and professional commitments. Working for the Department of Agriculture exposed them both to the negative effects of large-scale mining on Ghana's rural poor, especially in southwest Ghana, an area of fertile farmland and gold. Hannah and I were both working in the Ministry of Agriculture. And before then, um, I belonged to a nationalist group called the New Democratic Movement, where young people, some of them intellectuals, who knew that Ghana was rich, potentially. They were not happy about the way we are. We have not been able to manage our resources in, in the best interest of our people. So we continued studying what, what brings about this thing, uh, poverty, and the poverty is a social phenomenon. Um, it's not like somebody is born poor, but the conditions, you know, could prevail which could make people poor. So somewhere along the line, um, my university was closed down. So the university was closed down for about nine months, you know, around 83. When we came home, then we learned that the government at that time was going to sell the state gold mining com company, the Takwa Mine, um, for a pittance. In fact, the government had gone in for about 35 million Canadian dollar loan to rehabilitate the underground mine. And that became Awusu Korenteng's first test as organizer and advocate. I was given the task to build a campaign with underground miners because I was then on holidays. And I, I took that task serious. Why? Because first, the underground miners were very, very militant. And they were also going to suffer because they were going to be laid off because the, we also had information that the, the mining company was actually going to close down the underground mine in future. And it meant that a lot of the underground miners were going to lose their jobs. So I went underground, uh, took up employment, went underground, and became a Clayton driver underground and started sensitizing the miners on the uh, incoming problem they will be facing very soon. We did not win, of course. The mine was sold, and that is what we called Goldfields Ghana Limited today. But the, the advantage is that it gave me a certain consciousness about mining and um, how a state could lose um, its focus and, and, and sell out to, to foreign interests. What happened was that when the Goldfields Ghana Limited bought the company. First, it operated the underground mine for a, a short time. And because it operated the underground mine, it was giving all, all the assets, the land, the buildings, you know, the estates, as an addition for operating underground. Later on, they closed the underground mine and took up the surface mine. Many miners lost their jobs. Shocked, they turned to Daniel for answers. So I missed one of them, then they, they said, how did you know? that this was going to happen to us. I said, look, we, we learned it. And from there, then we followed on, into, on, on the issues about surface mining. And as, as agriculture, Hannah and I were working as agriculturists, we were having first hand information about how mining was affecting the peasants. That was how come we started this mining advocacy um, in, the, in, the, in the early 90s, the organizational way. But it was not until 98 that we formally launched WACA. But the, and the organization work had gone on for a long time. Ghanaian activists Daniel and Hannah Korenteng spend a lot of their time on the road, visiting communities helped by their NGO, Wacom offering education, training, and legal support. They help the residents better communicate and negotiate with large multinationals who mine the land on which they live. We are on our way to Takwa, and then uh, to a community that is affected by mining operations, Tebribe. Tebribe community was first resettled by the Tebribe Goldfields into the new Tebribe, where we'll be visiting and then uh, when it was sold out, they found themselves being surrounded by rock waste. So 
It's a, it's, it's a bad case because they are farmers and they're depending on the farm lands for survival. So many of them are without regular source of income now. A meeting in the local beer hall. Time to catch up and report back on pending court cases and various grievances. The Corentengs give advice and lend an ear to all who come. You know, mining goes with a lot of myths. Like it creates jobs, it brings development, it makes people's lives better, you know. Um, because every, I think I don't blame the people because if we talk about gold, you are talking about wealth. That, that, is, that is the first deception, that you are sitting on gold and somebody is going to mine it. You cannot imagine that, you know, for once, um, the person can take the gold away and leave you in a bad state. Definitely you think that the exploitation will bring development to whatever development means for people. And then it is also, f this, this myth is found by the, company, the companies themselves. That we are here to ensure that your lives get better and, you know, and things like that. And government also buys into it and think that mining is going to create jobs, it's going to make you know, people better. So the ordinary people, the rural people, whose only asset is land, uh, think that their, their lives will be improving. James Sarpong has been displaced by a mountain of rocks. My house is, he is over, over, over here. They, they put rocks on it. They fill it. They, they fill it with, with uh, wisdom. Where once stood a village, now a mountain of rock waste looms, the blight of surface mining. You say on the gold, but it, it doesn't help me. Let my jump on, because if not because of gold, all my family is with me here. But because of gold, see her, see her where I am now. As Africa's second largest producer of gold after South Africa, Ghana benefits considerably from its mineral wealth. Mining revenues swell government coffers, but also changes the predominantly agricultural economy. Some of the peasant farmers we're working with said that, oh, oh we are praying that uh, at least we also have a situation where our lands will be taken over by mining. They were praying for it. And then things started. They lost their jobs, they, their land, their lands were gone, their rivers polluted. Um, they are, the skills they had could not fit into the skills of mining. But mining is a, is a capital intensive kind of activity. So the, the, the myths in about three, four years fizzled out. Fizzled out. Then also the issue of compensation is, is one of the things that pains me most. Because I think that the, the farmers are also investors. They have invested their money and time with the hope of actually reaping some benefits and handing over their fields and farms to their children. If one acre of about 450 trees, you guess about say 7,100 7, um, Ghana cities or let's make it $5,000 for an acre of 450 trees and the money is given to, to that farmer, he thinks it's big money. In about three, four years, then the money is gone. Some go into very risky investments like buying cars and within two years, the cars are sitting on blocks. They turn around, their lands are gone. And let me tell you that in Ghana, people have a very much attachment to lands because they are linked to wars and people fighting to, um, their ancestors fighting to get the land for them. And then they become poor and they start having violent conflicts with the mining companies. Awusu Korenteng says huge open cast mines are a curse. That's why I've called them myths because for example, we think that mining creates em employment. If even the former sector creates about 15,000 employment. But according to the Trade Union Congress of, you know, of Ghana, they did a research and found out that uh, mining employs 1% of the active workforce. It destroys thousands of livelihoods. It may create 15,000 jobs and destroy thousands of livelihoods. You know, they come to think of the water pollution and human rights abuses. Um, and, and many other problems. So I would say that we are not getting the, 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 the mathematics right. We are actually not taking into consideration 
the social, economic, and environmental problems that are associated, associated with, with mining. So we take everything we are getting, the revenue we are getting in mining, as profit, because we don't we don't count the cost. We've lost our rivers. We worshipped rivers. We've lost our shrines. We worshipped shrines. We've lost our forests. We performed rites, rituals in the forest. When we want to uh, stool cheese, when we want to perform puberty rites, we use the forest. We've lost our water bodies. We use these water bodies for these rituals. We've lost everything. We've lost part of us. Wacom wants multinational mining companies to contribute to the sustainable development of communities affected by large-scale mining activity. It becomes very, very difficult when you are doing, doing a campaign against mining companies or doing mining advocacy. Because you are pitched against powerful forces. They have a big mining lobby. They have allies in all spheres of life, from NGOs, priesthood, religion, religious, religious groups, chiefs, politicians, parliamentarians, everywhere, the media. So you have to run twice as fast to stand at the same place. You put in a lot to get some minimal benefits. So we, in work and we celebrate every small success. Every small little success, we celebrate it. Because if we don't do that, you think that is a losing, you are fighting a losing battle. But thank God, in Ghana today, there's great national awareness about the harmful nature of mining operations. And we have succeeded in, not we, when I say we, that is Wakam and other NGOs working on mining in Ghana, have succeeded in getting Ghanaians to know that we are getting some revenues, but at a, at a huge cost. Next, family as the foundation. Yourself. Family is everything to Daniel Owusu Quarantine. Breaking bread and discussing the day ahead with his children, colleagues, and friends, spending time with his much loved first grandchild. I'm very proud of them, um, also because they share our views of life. Um, they have grown in a home where people come in, ordinary people come in and stay for some time. Uh, sometimes our activists on the field are sick, we bring them to the city and connect them to places where they can have medical care. So they are used to living with ordinary people and they are so accommodating and, and they, they support us a lot. They are also growing up to understand that money is not everything and that they have very important things about life which are more valuable than money. And I'm so happy and proud about, about that. Now I have a grandson, we have a grandson, a granddaughter, sorry, and a granddaughter the moment they start having grandchildren, then you should start writing your, your what do you call it? Your, ha your handing over notes. <laughs> it's an indication that you'll be passing off very soon. So God has blessed us with the granddaughter. She looks so lovely. And I'm hoping that we'll live a bit longer to, to ship, ship in her in, 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 in a way that would make sure, that will ensure that we have a trend of family activists who want to make a change. People think that I'm a crazy person, but I know what, how it feels like, how it feels like. And I always say that where my mother is buried now, I love my mother so much. Anytime I go home, I pass in front of her tomb and go home, and if somebody wants to mind there, I'm afraid I'll sit on the grave. I'll sit on, on the grave. And then, um, and, and ask the person if she can, he or she can do that in his or her hometown or her country. Whether she, he or she can think of her, the grave of her mother or father being destroyed to pave way for prophets for that company. I'll ask that person if he's able to look in my face and tell me, yes, I can do that in my country. I'll allow it. If that person cannot say so, I was set for the person to mow me in addition to my mother. And I feel the same for other people. 
These are the things that drive some of us. Obusu Korenteng has a strong belief in the power of the people. And through his NGO, he's trying to educate and energize them and their leaders to understand that they are all responsible for what they leave behind. We are a small group of thoughtful, committed people who want to change the world, who want to make a change, who want to make a difference. Four and minutes. we think that once we have the truth with us, um, one day this country will learn that we need to manage our resources well for generations yet to come and that we shouldn't become a selfish generation. The gold in the earth does not belong to this generation alone. It belongs to generations yet to come. That is what we should understand. And we cannot mess it up. God did not put it there for us alone. So that is the message I have. Thank you.